Good morning. How are you and can you hear me? I see Midge is here. I see Denise is here. Who else do we have nearby? You know, it seems like it's taken about 10 days, but here we are and uh, Facebook seems to be alerting you in a much more uh, quick fashion. Oh, Trace, you're here. Hello. Oh, I'm so happy. Good. All right, sound is good. That is good to know. Fantastic. Awesome, awesome. So for anyone who is just hopping into this workshop, the plan is that we, we start the content in about five minutes to just give people time for Facebook to alert you or not you because you're here already, but alert folks that the video is actually live and to, to come on in. So we won't actually start for about five minutes. So if you have something that you need to do between now and five minutes from now, by all means, go off, do it, grab yourself uh, your, your beverage of choice, get a pen and paper or you know some way of taking notes ready, whatever your preference is. Good morning, Rhonda. I'm glad that you are here as well. So we're gonna talk about marketing today. So that is going to be today's discussion. This is how we're gonna end the workshop because throughout this workshop, it has been seven days with three bonus sessions. So 10 days total and marketing has come up just a little bit here and there. And I've addressed questions as they've come up, but there's been a couple of things that I just wanted to make sure that we had time for. So if you have specific marketing questions that you would like me to address, please, by all means, put them in the comments and I will absolutely do so. On my list for today is to talk about the best ways to repurpose our content as well as workbooks. Those are the two things in particular that I have been promising that I will address for the last probably four days. And so I will do that. And then I also have some high level tips of just from an accountability standpoint, a couple of things that you can do to you know, put yourself, uh, push yourself a little bit outside of your comfort zone and, you know, get more people to recognize that you are working on a book and a book is coming. It, I, I promise you it'll be putting you outside of your comfort zone. So that much I can assure you. All right, hold on. I see a good morning, but I don't see a name. Uh, let's see. Oh, hey, good morning. Well, for you, uh, good afternoon, but I appreciate you putting good morning in for all of us. I like it. I'm glad that you're here as well. Oh, yeah, we're on day 10. You know, it's it's kind of crazy. And I, I said this yesterday, for those of you who are here, I started this workshop while I was on one vacation, and I'm ending this workshop. And as soon as I am done, uh, my son and I are on the road to go on a small vacation for the next couple of days. So I really, I put, you know, I bookended this workshop between vacations, which I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy about, I'm grateful for. It's been, I love doing this workshop. I truly, truly love doing it. So if we have not connected personally or directly yet, please reach out to me. I would be, I would love to get to know you more. And as I've been saying, you know, if you're considering doing the Getting Started for Authors program, you know, let's have a conversation about it. We can see if you're a right fit for you and then we can, you know, obviously just kind of go from there. But um, I am on vacation for the next couple of days, but I'll be back next week. So if you need or would like to uh, schedule time on my calendar, you'll be seeing some availability for next week. Good morning, Pamela from Nevada. I'm glad that you're here as well. We definitely have quite the quite the range of, uh, of locations that people are from, which is really cool. Def definitely scattered about the United States, that is for sure. And then we have uh, Hayut who is in uh, Israel. So we have, uh, you know, some folks on a much, uh, much later in the day already over there. And so, yeah, and I've, I've seen a couple of other folks from the UK popping in. I believe we had a New Zealander at one point. So we're all over the place. And I feel like there's something beautiful about what a global, a global society that we live in, that we can connect with really awesome people from all over the world. And we're not trapped geographically to just the, just the people immediately around us, which is kind of cool. So while we're waiting just a couple more minutes for everyone who will be here to be here, please, do you have questions? What questions might you have that I can make sure that I can answer for you? 
Good morning from Massachusetts on your way back to Connecticut. Good morning, Monica. Uh, I saw your, your uh, calendar scheduling thing come through this morning, so I can't wait for us to chat next week. I think it'll be fun. It'll be good to catch up. Yes. So marketing, that is going to be the conversation today. Good morning, Rebecca. I love that you have been here from the start. So many of you have been here from day one, which is so incredibly awesome. And so we're going to chat about marketing because marketing is one of those things that uh, is a bit of a mystery for many, for many of you. And that is just kind of more of a fact than anything. And, you know, there's no judgment in it. There's no right or no wrong. But, you know, when it comes to your book, the writing process obviously is the most important because we can't publish or market a book that is not written. So that has to always be the the primary focus is getting the book written. But beyond that, it's thinking about how, you know, we talked about, what day was it? It wasn't yesterday, it was the day before. So it must have been Monday, we talked about publishing paths and, you know, what type of publishing path might be the one that makes the most sense for you. And then based on that publishing path, marketing does vary a little bit based on what direction you might want to go in. And so it really is writing, publishing, and then marketing. And so that is why we've, you know, it, today was going to be just kind of a wide open Q and A, but you know, I really want to focus it on marketing, but if you do have other questions, cause we are on our last day, this is, you know, day 10, it's been 10 for some of you, I would imagine 10 long days because I have no shortage of information to share. And I know that I am just kind of fast and furiously throwing the information at you. So I can imagine for some of you. You might be a little bit tired, a little fatigued, overwhelmed. You have a lot of new information to work with, which I think is good, but it might take a little bit of time to kind of parse out what you're going to what you're going to do with that information. And so, I feel like it makes sense to kind of end on the marketing cuz marketing is something, it's an, our opportunity to kind of dream big and think about like what are all the the cool things that we can do and how we can impact our potential readers because at the end of the day, Unless we tell readers that our book exists, they do not know it exists. You know, it's pretty infrequent. And I'm actually, this will be a good uh, ask of those of you who are here in the comments. How often do you go to Amazon just searching for books, like without a specific book in mind? I'm curious if you don't mind just entertaining me for a bit and just kind of posting in the comments. Like, are you a person that someone says, hey, you should buy X book and you just go to, I say Amazon, it could be whatever, you know, whatever bookstore, uh, a, you know, book place that you're purchasing from. But, you know, how often are you just kind of browsing, I guess I would say, in an online fashion? I'm sure in a physical bookstore, there's much more browsing. But online, do you browse for a book or were, or were you recommended a book and you're just on your way to wherever you're going to purchase that book? Right, let's say good morning, Pamela. I'm interested in marketing. Used to do that along with my graphic arts background. Awesome. Good morning, Ethel. Uh, let's see. Monica saying I only go when I have a specific book in mind and then I browse. Midge never. I only go when I hear of a book I want or a gift for my wife. Yep. Yep. Anybody else? So it looks like I know for me personally, I will browse books on the Libby app. And if you are not familiar with Libby, you 100% should be familiar with it. It is a app that connects to your local library card. And so you are able to access audiobooks and eBooks directly through it, just as part of your library, your uh, commitment to your local library. And it's not specific to only books that are available at your local library. You're, it's like a huge database that you're available to, to go through. So if you don't have that, uh, I highly suggest it. And the reason I bring that up is that I will browse that because a lot of times, because it is a library, the library doesn't always have new releases and there's, a, there's just a lot of nuance with what they do or don't carry. So I will go in and just start looking around to say like, what audiobooks are available and what, uh, you know, what might I be able to, uh, to check out? So I am, let's see if I can, oh, where's my camera? See that little, the purpley maroon one that says Libby? That's the one. So that's what the app looks like. It's, it's awesome. You just have to make sure you have a current library card. And if you don't just go to your, you know, your, your local library and get one, it takes like two minutes and then it supports the local library too. All right. Let's see. Never browsing on line. Hold on. 
sometimes I may purchase something that comes up in suggestions when seeking a certain book. I browse for grandkid books. Yep, that makes sense. Never, says Denise. Rhonda, often, a few times a month, usually something recommended in another book or podcast. Denise uses Libby. Yeah, I, I just, I love Libby. And it's surprising how many people don't know it exists. And I'm surprised that the library itself does not actually promote this more often, but that is beside the point. All right, so it looks like everyone's kind of a, a little bit of a, a mixed bag in terms of, of if you are a browsing kind of person or if you're going directly with the intention because something was recommended to you and you want to to go purchase it. I know I have a to be read reading list that is probably three dozen books deep because I'm always learning about really awesome books and I do read a lot of books. I think I'm, I wanna say I've already read 40 something books this year. I think I'm close to 40. Um, it's my, I read instead of watch TV for the most part. So, you know, I'll eventually get through all of them, but you know, we have to think about the user experience and the reader journey to getting to your book. So, Something that I am always promoting, like always promoting, is if you are trying to really figure out how to market your book, we have to think about where your people would be acquiring your book. And this goes back to day two of the workshop around target readers. If I'm not mistaken, I believe it was on day two, we were talking about target readership. So if you have a loyal audience of audiobook readers, there is a very strong correlation that people who listen to audiobooks will also be podcast listeners. There's also a ton of people who listen to podcasts and read, you know, whether it's an ebook or a, you know, a paperback or hardcover book. So when we think about it from that standpoint, one of the easiest things typically is to get on podcasts of other people who will be the, like that podcast host is going to be that person who makes you as the author shine, which gets their listeners excited about how awesome your book is. And then they go and they, you know, maybe they're gardening while they're listening, maybe they're driving while they're listening, and they'll eventually go to Amazon most of the time, unfortunately, but Amazon, and they will purchase your book. And so that's how we have to be thinking about how do we get in front of those readers? This is not the case for everybody. Uh, let's see, who is saying this? I have a monthly Audible account and when I get an urge to buy a book and then not read, <laughs> I get the Audible first. Then if I like it and wanna have it in my real library of books, I'll buy it. That's a good, a good way to approach it. I also have, a, um, I have the, I don't even know what it's called, Kindle, Kindle Unlimited, the like the, you know, unlimited ebooks monthly through Amazon. And I also have Audible monthly and then I use Libby. So that's where all my money goes is on books. And then I also buy a lot of print books because, you know, this is why I'm in this business. I love books. Uh, let's see. Podcasts are definitely a key place where I'm introduced to books. Thank you for saying that. So because this is what we have to think about is, and I'll give you just a, a random example. We had an author that we worked with a number of years ago, and she was part of one of our one of our programs. And what what we talked about in that program was for her to do pre-sales. And so basically to say, um, just start selling the book before the book is available. It might sound crazy. It might say, it might feel like it's out of integrity for you. But if you have a if you have a title if you have a subtitle and you have your cover, you can go off and market your book as if the book is already written, done and ready to roll. Even if you are still in the early stages of writing, as long as you are actually going to deliver on the book that you have said that you are, the, the book that you are selling, as long as you deliver on it, you're completely in alignment and you're, you know, you're operating with integrity and you know, sincerity and all of those things. It's when people kind of come up with some BS book that they never plan on actually uh, producing and then take people's money and run, then obviously that's a completely different story. But it is very, very common to be doing pre-sales for your book before the book is finished, the, finished in the publishing process and sometimes before it's even done being written. The benefit of doing this way is that when people see that 3D image of your book, they just assume that the book is available. They just, they make all kinds of assumptions that, you know, here's this book, there's a 3D version, like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go buy it. And what they can do is that they can pre-sale, they can do a pre-sale through 
you. They could do a pre-sale on Amazon, but the better way to do it is to pre-sale it directly through you because then you end up making more money that way. So that's just a side note. So what you could consider doing, and I'm not saying that, you know, you should or shouldn't, but just a thought is that if you do focus your energy for just a little bit on what you want your title and subtitle to be, because those are the really, the, the important things. And what you can do is with your, as long as you have a title that's not going to change, the subtitle can change. I will, I will share it like, so we've worked on a, countless books at this point where we don't have the subtitle figured out until a little bit further, further toward the end of the process, just because it kind of morphs and changes as the content in your book changes through editing. But 95% of the time, the title itself is 100% the same. So you could go with a placeholder title, a placeholder subtitle, get your cover, and then be on your way. This was a derailment to my, to my actual point. So this particular author that we were working with, we, you know, we helped figure out the title. The title was solid, weren't changing it. Subtitle, a little bit iffy because the subtitle is the promise of the book. Subtitles, I think, are more important in many ways than the title itself. There's, they're, equal, they're probably equal importance, but I think the subtitle, a lot of times people just kind of slap on there and just kind of think that nobody's looking at it. But there's a lot of different, a lot of different uh, uh, technological factors that are at play from the keywords that you use, the readability of the the subtitle. There's a bunch of things. So this author went on The View, which, you know, I don't know how many millions of, of watchers that The View had. And this was a, this was a couple of years ago, probably in 2017, 2018, maybe 2017, if I had to guess. And she was convinced that she was going to sell a ton of copies. She thought for sure she was going to sell like a million copies. And I don't want to be the person who rains on anyone's parade. I am, as we talked about on day three, I think it was, or no, somewhere in the middle of, you know, strategist, therapist, and cheerleader. Like I have to be there to, you know, really, really help amp you up. And I knew that this was not going to be as successful. I didn't realize how unsuccessful it was going to be. I just knew that that her expectations were not properly matched. And we tried, I tried to get her to understand and it's fine. You know, like you don't know what you don't know, which I've talked about at great length at this point. And so she went on, her segment was amazing. Her book, um, which never did end up coming out for the record, um, her book was very niche and I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, actually call her out directly. So her book was a very niche topic, like really, really narrow. And what happens is when we have narrow topics or we have, I've actually never said it this way, but like narrow personalities, like when we are, you know, cause there are some people that they're like a golden retriever. Everybody loves a golden retriever. And then there are people who are like maybe a Rottweiler where it takes like a certain type of person to, to love like a pit bull or a Rottweiler, right? Um, I love all animals, does not matter. Uh, could care less what type of animals there are, but there are a lot of people who have very specific, like, Ooh, I can't have, I can't have an animal like that. Like that's, that, they're, they're too intense, too much for me. Whereas everybody loves like labs and retrievers. So she had a very niche niche topic and a niche personality. So when you have one of those two factors and you go on a nationwide program and you're selling your book, even if there's 4 million people watching that particular segment, there's going to be a micro, micro, micro percentage of people who actually resonate with what you're saying. So from a credibility standpoint and from a resume building standpoint, Absolutely. It's amazing to be able to say that you were on The View, especially you can take the, um, you know, like a, a snippets of video from that interview. Like that looks amazing from a marketing standpoint. But results wise, she sold 40, she pre-sold 40 copies of her book. And I, I said 4 million. I have no idea how many people, I have no clue. I don't watch The View. I know nothing about it. But you would imagine that there's probably millions of viewers. She sold 40 books, pre-sold. So she's thinking she's going to go on the show and she's going to convert. So let's just use 4 million for somewhat easy math. So she's thinking, okay, there's 4 million watching this. I'm going to sell a million copies of my book. That means she's going to convert 25% of those viewers into buyers. And if we look at how often, if we look at our own behaviors, and this all depends on the topic, the person, the target, dem the target reader demographics and everything, when we look at that, 
That's a 25% conversion, which is probably wildly unrealistic to begin with, but even more so because our topic was so niche and narrow, like so niche. It, it, like, it just, so it was so disappointing and so deflating. And so I was explaining to her, which is what I want to share with you, is that if we think about podcasts, podcasts are the way to go to hell with big media, which every PR person would probably be mad at me for saying, uh, and I have a lot of friends who have PR companies, but the big media from a result standpoint, for the most part, in many instances, is kind of useless because you don't get the results. Again, from a credibility, from the optic standpoint, those are all amazing things. But when we look at who is going to buy your book, like I have been on uh, any host of podcasts. I've also run four podcasts. I have two currently that are active and I'm on people's shows on a regular basis. And when, anytime I'm on someone's show, like there is some result that can be seen, whether it's someone who schedules time for us to talk because they heard me talking about publishing and now they want to know a little bit more. And then maybe they, you know, eventually become um, someone who works with us at PYP. Great. Other times I might be talking about my book and then you can almost immediately see an uptick in sales when you're, when you release an episode and then your book becomes available. So podcasts are really the way to go. And it doesn't mean that the podcast itself has to have a huge following. That's the other thing too. If you can get on a show that has a niche topic and has millions of followers, then you are in great shape. Because the closer your message is aligned to the content that is being told on that podcast, the more likelihood that person is going to say, oh, wow, like that was a really inspiring conversation. I definitely need to go buy XYZ's book because they're already listening to that podcast specifically for that topic of information. So if your book's topic connects to the topic of that podcast, the likelihood of that conversion is going to be significantly higher. So you could probably be on a show that maybe has a thousand people who listen to it. A thousand is not a bad number in the grand scheme of the podcast world. It's low, but if you, if you're on a show that has a thousand listeners that are a thousand subscribers who are there listening to every single episode, you could probably easily get 40 people to buy your book being on that episode versus being exposed to millions of followers, followers of a show who could care less about your topic. They're just watching you talk because you happen to be a guest on The View. So uh, I know that was perhaps a little bit long-winded, but I, I just wanted to share that let's try to reframe how we think about marketing and stop thinking about all of these big, uh, big, crazy kind of goals and think about how can we leverage and use the resources and the people that we have access to, et cetera. And so this also applies like, you know, maybe it's a, maybe somebody's newsletter, right? So maybe, you know, somebody who has a newsletter and there's something really kind of cool about what you do and how it fits what they do and how they serve their clients. Maybe they give you a spot uh, in their newsletter. Maybe you do a Q and a, you know, a Q and a with the author and it goes into the newsletter. I guarantee you, you're going to see some interest in your book from something like that. Even if there's only 500 people who get that newsletter again, versus someone who's going to send your information to their marketing list of 10,000 people, but 10,000 people who could care less about what you're writing about because it's not in alignment with that list of people. Does all of this make sense so far? Let's see. I just wanted to, okay. So Rebecca saying most podcasts have the advantage of more depth with their guests. There's more time to get into a book compared to a seven to 10 minute TV format. That's yeah, exactly. Rebecca. Exactly. Yep. And then who's asking about, fun? okay, uh, Monica, you mentioned fundraising. If I did a GoFundMe, then they get a book when it's in print. Does that tend to raise money? It's like a presale. Absolutely. Yes. So fundraising for your book, oh, there's so many good directions that you can do this with. We're actually working with um, uh, an author now who she is doing the fundraising to, um, and she's, her, her topic's incredible. Again, I, I I feel like I'm being vague, but I just don't want to be like exposing people when I don't have their permission to, but, um, her topic's incredible. It's very empowering. Um, there's like a, a DEI kind of component to, to what she's doing. It's about, you know, kind of like uplifting women. And there's like 15 people who were involved in this particular project. And it, which is a lot because there's a, a lot of contributors to the story. And 
we've been kind of helping them strategize on how to fundraise in order to have the resources that they need to get into the full publishing process. And I kind of took a look at their GoFundMe page that they had already started. And I was like, all right, here's where I see that you're missing the mark. And I gave just, you know, a whole bunch of recommendations on, on what to change. And so there's already like, you know, you can always see like an uptick in interest when a page is structured properly. So you could do GoFundMe. You could also do Indiegogo. And I know that there's a third one, Kickstarter. You could do any one of those. In my experience, GoFundMes tend to be things that are much more personal focused. They're, you know, raising money for funeral expenses. They're, you know, helping someone with a, you know, a terminal illness you know, someone who got into an unexpected car accident, like usually it's like something on a much more personal front in my experience with GoFundMe. So I would recommend looking at Kickstarter or Indiegogo, which feel, uh, have a little more business focus to them. And you can kind of do them in both places. So when we think about fundraising, the goal of what we're trying to do is get people to pre-invest in what we're doing. Inevitably, you are going to have friends and family and colleagues, former coworkers, a whole litany of people could be a community. Uh, if you're part of some kind of uh, church group or community group, there's so many different directions where you can kind of get that support in advance. Uh, if you have a client base, you can absolutely, you know, reach out to your client base. So what you want to be considering, and this is why as part of the bonuses for our getting started for authors program, we have a whole kind of a session on this. And I actually bring in an expert. Uh, her name is Mary Valoni, and she is a fundraising expert specifically. And so, you know, she gives all kinds of just really awesome tips too. And so what you want to be doing is that making sure that you are hooking the person who is landing on your, your page, however they found your fundraising page, you want to be hooking them with the message of why this book matters and why they need to be paying attention. So that is the biggest piece of all of this is the messaging from a marketing standpoint of why should I care? You're writing a book about X, Y, Z. Why me as me, random lay person, why do I care? If you can answer why do I care or the whole with them, the what's in it for me, if you can answer that question at the very top of it, every, they'll continue to read the rest of it. But if you do not answer why, they're not going to continue because we have, you know, attention spans of goldfish and we move very quickly through content. And if we don't, if we're not hooked immediately, we're moving on. So this is why having that 3D rendering of your book cover can be really powerful because you can use it here as well like in this kind of pre-sale pre-format. And so if you can hook them in with why, then what you can do is package different ways to make money. So instead of just saying, here's my book, great, perfect. Okay, yeah, here's your book. I can go buy your book, sure. But what other incentives can you provide? So is it if you buy one copy of my book, I will donate another copy to some organization. So there's definitely, you know, we've definitely worked uh, with a number of books that, you know, maybe they're targeting uh, younger, uh, younger demographics, or maybe they're targeting demographics that from a socioeconomic standpoint, um, aren't in as good shape as maybe the author is. And so being able to donate and give back and give books away might be a really awesome, valid strategy. I don't know if anyone can hear my cat howling, but she is howling at my door. I can't with this cat. Um, it's always peaches as I was talking about my children's book idea with this one uh, that'll be coming out at some point. I'm, I am working on it because she's ridiculous. Side note. Okay. So we're, so what we're thinking about is how do we package what we're doing? So if we say, here's a book, buy a book, I'll donate a book or buy a book and I will donate random example. We have a book that it's actually one of the first books we published. We had two books that came out almost at identical timings and what um, her book is, it's her memoir told through the fictional lens of her cat. And so when a book sells of hers, she donates a can of cat food to a shelter. Very simple type of thing. So if we're thinking about a fundraising platform or fundraising site, what we can say is if you buy this book, I will donate a can of cat food to an animal shelter. Or if you buy this book, um, you know, especially for those, because I definitely know that there's some of you who uh, there's a foster care component 
to what you're writing about. It could be something like if you buy a book, I will donate a backpack to a child in the foster care system because that I'm not going to go down that whole rabbit hole, but like that's something that is so often um, just something as simple as a backpack is completely uh, not thought through for for children in the system. So you could be thinking about from a very uh, altruistic standpoint of how can you be giving back while you're selling your book? Because what that will do is that you can you can charge more for that book. It doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to be here, you know, pre pre order my book for twenty dollars. You can say if you if you pre order my book for fifty dollars, you're going to get a signed, you know, signed to you a copy of the book before anyone else gets it. And I am donating a backpack in your name to X Y Z organization for a child in need. It is very difficult to say no when you've really crafted that message to why somebody should be buying your book. And then when they're like, oh shit, like I get like I feel like I get this benefit too, because I'm supporting this author who's supporting all of these other people. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so Monica's talking about thought about thought about doing a webinar related. Yes, I'm getting to that and getting to webinars and workbooks as it all ties to this. Exactly. So we can think about, all right, so I'm going to sell. So when I was selling, uh, pre-selling my memoir last summer, I was doing, I did $30 for the paperback and I did $50 for the hardcover. And you would think that that's high, but you know what? People want to support authors. People want to buy direct from you versus buying on Amazon. You know, people, in many ways, people are kind of over Amazon. And so they will come to you and they will buy from you and it gives you an opportunity to make more money. And what that does is it helps you fuel and fund the editing costs, the design costs, the getting it published, like all of those things. It's just basically giving you the money now to then have it, uh, you know, come out, uh, have it come out later. The other things that you can do are if you buy five books, I will do X, Y, Z for, you know, for example, we have an author who, her book will be out in a couple of weeks. Oh no, it'll be out early October and she is doing bookmarks. So for everyone who pre-orders her book, she's doing bookmarks. Perfect. Um, Monica, my son offered the original drawings to his children's book to big donors. Yes, that's exactly it. So that's a great example. So if you are, you know, if you have something that's artistic, so uh, Trace, I know you're here and watching. Um, she's part of our current Getting Started for Authors program and decided to tune in to hear about workbooks as I'll be getting to just in a couple minutes. And so um, as an artist and as an illustrator, in your case, you absolutely could be using original drawings and original art as something to people who um, are donating a large amount of money. So we can say, you know, if you buy five books, I'll give you a bookmark. We have an author who's doing that right now. We've had authors who, if people bought 15 books, they would be invited to a private webinar or a private kind of meet and greet with the author, right? And okay, Trace saying, love the drawing auction idea. Yes, exactly. Um, right. So like, how can we find ways to monetize the things that we already have and the things that we love doing? So we have had people who have done, if you buy, I don't know, how, I don't know what the number of the books were, but if you buy a certain number of books, I will have you as a guest on my podcast. You know, it might seem, and, and it's risky because you have no idea who this person is and they might not be a great guest on your show, but that might, for you, it might make sense. For someone else, it might not make sense. So all of this is kind of take what applies to you, leave the rest. You could have a video series. So maybe, um, and I know uh, Rhonda in here, we've talked about you doing a video series. So in your case, maybe it is if you buy 20 copies of my book, you get my free, you get my video series that's valued at X amount of dollars. Done. So now you might've gotten them to buy, you know, maybe they bought uh, 10 books at 20 bucks a piece and your online course only costs $97. You're going to be making significantly more versus thinking about it as a one-to-one -one transactional sale for a $20 book. And that's what we want to be thinking about. Uh, Trace, I'm considering offering a free decision-making or visioning session if you buy three copies. Totally, totally. That would be perfect. And so maybe you do that in a group session, group setting, or maybe you do it in a one-on-one -on -one setting. So if, if someone wants to interact with you one-on-one, -on -one, especially for those coaches, 
in this uh, who are watching. If you have something that's one on one, maybe they have to buy a lot more books in order to get access to you one on one. Or if they want to be part of this group uh, visioning session, maybe they only have to buy three books. And so it's about being really creative with this because you could truly take this in any direction you could possibly imagine. You just have to think about what would the reader of my book be interested in receiving from me? Because for every book, it's going to be different. Now, this is where workbooks come in. Workbooks are an amazing tool for those of you who are writing nonfiction. They are very, very uh, valuable. Um, they can be profound. I'm just grabbing some visuals for you. And uh, let's see if I can not knock these off. So when we, okay, there are, uh, there are a number of types of readers that exist. I happen to be in one camp of this type of reader. There are people who will write on every single page of a book. They will bend pages. They will rip pages out. They will circle things. They will make notes. They will have post-it notes that are stick sticking out in a hundred different directions. That is one type of person. Then there's another type of person who uh, does not want to have a single nick or mark or pen mark uh, in their book at all. I happen to be the latter. Uh, I believe, Trace, if I'm not mistaken, you are the former. And what we want to be thinking about is how do we serve both of those people? How do we serve both of those people, one who really could care less about writing in a book and someone who doesn't want to write in a book? We provide a workbook. That's what we can do. Uh, Rhonda's asking, why would somebody want to buy multiple books? That's a great question. Some books lend themselves really well as gifts to other people. And sometimes it's more about just a shopping mindset and mentality to be like, oh, if I buy one book, it's $20. But if I buy, uh, you know, 10 books, it's some, some bulk rate discount. Um, so what you want to be doing from a messaging standpoint is explaining to them why they should buy more. We don't want them, we don't want the reader to have to figure this out on their own. We want to say, uh, we want the message to be, you know, buy five books and give four away. You know, uh, let's see, Rebecca is saying gifts, maybe one reason. Uh, Monica, I bought four copies of a book and gave them to, to my daughters and friends. Exactly. So it just kind of depends on what your particular topic is, because for some people, it would make sense to buy a lot of books. So, you know, if you're doing something that's in uh, like a leadership standpoint, uh, something that something that applies to kind of uh, business or executives or, or things like that, then what we can do in those situations is say, you know, buy a book for yourself and give the rest to your team, give the rest to your management, give the rest to, we have to, we have to kind of uh, package that up for them. Uh, for us coaches, it could be a book club group who plan to use the book for a mastermind. Book clubs is something that I can get to as well while we're talking. Let me make myself a note. So, because book clubs are another huge opportunity. So for workbooks, when we go back, if you have the book constructed well from the start, let me see. Okay. All right. It's going to be difficult because I'm trying to do this on, uh, you know, on a screen. Let me remove that and see if this makes, and it helps a little bit. So here's this book. It's called Pride Leadership Strategies for the LGBTQ uh, plus leader to be the king or queen of their jungle. This is from uh, Dr. Steve Iacovelli, who came out a couple of years ago. And in this book, it is super, super interactive, like really incredibly interactive. So, you know, if I just flip open to any random page, you can see that there's, um, you know, a whole thing about, you know, reflective questions. There's reflective questions at the end of every chapter. There are uh, areas of things that you can learn. His audience is very corporate. So it is really for the corporate LGBTQ person who is trying to develop their leadership skills so they can excel within the corporation or another corporation that they're working for. He does, his marketing is freaking amazing. So if anyone wants to check out what he does, he's got online programs. He does all kinds of giveaways. He's got, uh, he gives away mouse pads with his. So he's got a whole um, online program called the Lions, uh, which all kind of like follows the acronym. Like it's just... He's very brilliant when it comes to marketing. So I think this was, when did we publish this? I want to say it was the end of 2019. So now we have the Pride Leadership Leaders Workbook. So look at the beauty of 
these two things side by side, right? So now you as the reader know immediately, wow, these two things completely go together, right? So this one we published about a year and a half before this one came out. This one came out as a result of the, the conversations that people were coming to him with. Now this workbook, it's a thing of beauty. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna uh, speak to its beauty. Like it is a full color, uh, very difficult to kind of see, see this. It's available wherever you buy books, both the workbook and workbook are available. So if you are feeling inspired by wanting to kind of, kind of see it in, in the flesh, you know, like there's exercises and you can see at the top, well, this is backwards. Uh, it says chapter four, right? So this workbook directly ties to the content in chapter four. So what this does from a fundraising standpoint, as well as just a general business standpoint, is that now you have two products to sell. You have the book, which I don't know what the price of this book is at the moment. I want to say it used to be $25. Honestly, not sure what the price of this is right now. It's all available online. Uh, say it's $20. Now we have this package, $45 package for these two things, but he can go into a company because his, or his clients are corporations and say, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to have, uh, we're going to, we're going to have all of your, your, your LGBTQ leaders. We're going to have them read this book. Then we're going to, um, get together for six sessions to complete the workbook together. From a packaging standpoint, this makes the book so much more valuable when there is a workbook tied to it. So if you are a coach or a consultant of any kind, having a workbook is absolutely critical. So when we think about how to kind of connect the dots, so like we have, again, so we have this example where the branding is like brilliant, genius, and spot on. Another example is my own stuff, which is not intentionally packaged together, but it's how things kind of sometimes organically come to be. So one of the first projects that um, I did when uh, I was starting PYP back in 2015, 2016, is that I created this journal. It's called Therapy Notes for Families, Staying Organized with Your Child's Needs. This was a very specific thing that came up because of dealing with a child with a uh, pretty significant mental health diagnosis uh, can be challenging to keep track of just everyday basic damn things. So, you know, we had uh, places for height, weight, blood pressure, medication names, dosage, family notes, um, comments from the clinician, clinician information, to-do list, just to keep everything in, all in one place, just to keep it in place. Because it's complicated AF when you're a parent trying to like manage your child's uh, health needs when no providers talk to each other. So I created this. This was one of the first things, not my first book. This is probably the fourth book I put to, put out for my own, uh, myself. But if you have read my memoir, House on Fire, what I have been finding is that a lot of people are reading this after they have been in the situation that I have been in, or they are orbiting people that are around them that are in a similar situation that I was in. So when they are orbiting other people who are in similar situations, this book becomes a companion to this one. They are not branded the same in any way, shape, or form. But this journal type of workbook is a companion to this book for those who are struggling with the mental health issues that my family went through. So this is a less, uh, you know, this was more, this kind of came up recently where I was able to kind of connect the dots. Whereas something like this, Super intentional from the start, okay? And I have a third option, a third third uh, version to show you too. So here's a, uh, a book, another one of our early books that we put out. It's called Urban Trauma, A Legacy of Racism. And uh, Dr. Misa Akbar is here in New Haven, Connecticut, and is one of the most brilliant people that I know. And so her book came out first, and it's really a Venn diagram of racism and trauma and how that intersects uh, primarily within urban communities. What she did a couple of years after the book, uh, this book came out, because this came out in 2017. I want to say the workbooks came out in 2019 or even maybe in the beginning of 2020. We have, let me pull up a page to show you. Yeah, it came out in early 2020. We have this workbook that is the Urban Trauma Workbook for Professionals. So we have the book, we have the workbook. 
This is even more nuanced and this might be applicable for some of you. With this one, this is a professional's workbook. And so she has this, um, and I'll show you just like one, one random page. Uh, because they, they all like, so here's, um, here's a, a self-assessment page, right? So, and I don't want to give, um, this is highly, uh, co uh, trademarked, copywritten, intellectual property, very, like very highly done. So I'm not, I'm not going to show you a bunch of it, but what we knew when we were working on the book itself was that this book is a supplement for mostly people who are working with populations of patients that might be experiencing what her, her, the entirety of what she does is based around this, this concept and premise of urban trauma. So for her, we knew that this book would be best suited being marketed and sold to clinicians. So whether it's, you know, child psychologist, um, psychotherapist, um, any, any number of different people, people who are serving other people. So her one stop, one opportunity is to market the workbook to the professional who again, might be a psychotherapist, maybe, um, maybe they're, you know, maybe they work for a large, um, institution that works with patients on a regular basis. Maybe they're in private practice. It kind of comes in a lot of different configurations. So we have this one and I have the other one, but it's on the other side of my office that I will not grab. Um, there is another workbook that is the workbook for the patient. So now the marketing opportunity and the packaging opportunity is you as the person who was like, wow, I'm really, uh, I'm, I have a deficit of information on how to serve, to serve my patients. Let me read this book. Now I want to apply what I've learned in this book in my practice. In how I do that is that I buy my professional workbook. That is the workbook that I look at as the professional while the patient has their own workbook that they work from. So the packaged situation here is the clinician typically buys one of these, but they are buying 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 of the patient workbooks to go with their patients. Are, are we following here? So this workbook, I don't know what she's currently selling it for, but it's not, it's not like a $20 workbook. This is like a 70, 80, $100 workbook because it is a specific book meant to last for a very long time with that clinician. And then there's the opportunity to say, hey, if you buy 10 uh, patient workbooks, you can do it for X amount of dollars. So these are, you know, similar, but different in a lot of ways. So this one, ha this is a very, very uh, multi -la multi layered and complex uh, way to be selling this book, but it sells, uh, it sells quite well, and it's impacting a lot of people. So one of these three workbooks are just, these are just three, uh, three suggestions that I had based on having them sitting on my bookshelf behind me. This could absolutely work for what you're doing. It's just a matter of really looking into what is going to make sense for you. What is not going to make sense for you? Because not everyone has, like not all of you have an opportunity to have, you know, a clinician and a patient workbook, right? And some of you might, but not everyone does. And so some of you might not be selling to corporations. You might be selling to an individual person. So like for mine, mine is very much like the individual person package. Steve's is more so the corporate package. And then this one is more of kind of the uh, patient clinician package. Very, very different. But the execution of the, the workbooks and the books themselves are very, very similar. It's just the marketing of it that makes it very different. Is all of this making sense? Uh, Monica saying, I did a 60 page workbook to use with my six part webinar series. I would love to have such a beautiful version for sale. Yeah, it doesn't have to be complicated. That's the thing. You know, it doesn't, especially if you already have it, it's just a matter of adapting what you already have into a format that works for the, uh, for the printing and distribution process. We have a book that's gonna come out. Uh, I believe her book launch is on September 15th or September 17th, whatever the Thursday is. Uh, and she's here in Connecticut and she's doing a, a small kind of gathering in West Hartford. And for hers, we have a printed workbook that will be available that, you know, people can buy. 
but she also has the PDF pages that are available on the um, on her website. But you have to know how to get to those pages on the website. So that's kind of part of her thing of like, hey, if you pre-order, if I'm not mistaken, her pre-orders include a tote bag as well. So it's like, if you pre-order, you'll get access to, you'll get access to the workbook, but it's a digital workbook that people can download and do whatever they want with. So you might even want to approach it that way too. You could just do a digital download where people just print it out and do their own thing, or you can have it in one of these very gorgeous, uh, gorgeous types of fashions. It's entirely up to you. One other thing that I wanted to address that kind of dovetails into kind of the idea of like, how do we market to a lot of people is the book club, book club idea. So my memoir came out last year. It's in the guide section as the ebook version. If anyone would like to read it, you are more than welcome to. And I have in the back of it, oh my God, about to rip my own book. I have in the back of it a whole bunch of book club questions because I wanted to provide book club questions for people to help kind of steer them in a healthy direction because uh, it could be very easy to, to read, especially my story, because there's a, there's a lot to it. So if you haven't, if you've read it, you know what I mean. If you haven't, uh, you know, there's a lot. And I wanted to steer the conversation, help steer the conversation in a really healthy manner. And so book clubs are amazing. So if you include book club questions right out of the gate in what you're doing, you're already going to be at an advantage because you're planting the seed to the person reading this that, oh, like, I didn't even think I should do this for a book club. Let me mention it to my book club. Perfect. So I have done a couple of book clubs. I did one that was a smaller group that was a bunch of mental health practitioners. I happen to know one of them and uh, her and her partner, and then they've all been meeting for like a decade. And so it was a very small private group. There's like maybe nine of them. And it was, it was really intense, I will tell you that, because they were asking a lot of questions about the mental health theme, which is 100% woven from start to finish of this book, is mental health. And so that was what their theme was, was very much about um, just asking a lot of really nuanced questions. But it was a very safe space because, you know, we were all there. Now, there was nine of them. So I know that nine people bought my book, whether it was, you know, some of them had uh, bought the audio version, some had done ebook, and there were some that had done um, the, the hardcover or paperback. And so how great is that? Because now I know at least I got nine sales. You know, it might not be, you know, it might seem like, oh, it's only nine sales, but it's still nine sales. And it's nine people who now know that this work exists. So when they are within their own uh, mental health practice and they're like, oh crap, like I can hear my patient talking about the very specific things spoken about here. Let me pass that on to the patient. So that's kind of what we want to be thinking about. Additionally, um, I did a, a much larger book club that was for a LGBTQ uh, women asterisk uh, focused uh, organization, uh, like a literary type of organ organization. And there's like 130 people on it. Uh, it was it was a much bigger thing, and it was a fantastic conversation because they were asking a lot of other questions that were more on like the LGBTQ side of things, which it's in here because it's who I am, but it's. It is not like a central theme. I will just tell you that. Um, but that was like a lot of the questions that were around there. Now, of those 130 people, they had, whoever, like they had to buy the book. So that was a lot of sales for the book because of that specific book club. So if your book is a memoir, you have tons of opportunity because people love doing uh, book clubs around memoirs. If your book is nonfiction and you have an opportunity to sell to a corporation, you're in great shape there because you have a large amount of people to possibly get to purchase it. So, you know, if they're like, oh, we need to use this book as, um, as part of, you know, like a training program or something like that, let's do a book club with it. Boom. You know, you might get like 300 sales for that. We actually published uh, this book in the end of June. It's called The Real Lives of Transgender and Non-Binary Humans. And this is our first uh, anthology book that we've created as a company. So it, it shares... Uh, the stories of about a dozen really amazing people. And we just created a, a book club question PDF to accompany uh, this, this book in particular, because instead of just having this book out there, we are marketing this book to corporations who need to up their game in terms of their inclusion behaviors 
for the trans and non-binary community specifically. And so by having this book and having this very beautifully laid out PDF that one of our graphic designers did, we're just doing outreach to say, hey, uh, we noticed that you are actively doing outreach on this, this, and this. Uh, we think this book might be a really good opportunity to use as a book club. So that is our ask. Our ask is very specific book club. We have book club questions for nonprofits, for corporations, for people who consider themselves activists. And I feel like there's a fourth one that we have. And so we're just kind of uh, providing the, the questions that are applicable to the right people. Because this book is a conversation starter and it can be the thing that helps influence and create change, which is ultimately what we're all going for. So these are just a number. I could talk about marketing all day long if that is not obvious. Uh, so these are just some ideas to think about. So let's see, Denise is saying, I couldn't imagine how a workbook would work for my book. Now I do. Oh, that's awesome, Denise. Curious if you have um, if you have any ideas what that, what that is. Uh, Trace is saying, great idea to include book club questions. Yeah, and they're really, um, you know, you can ask other people to, to help guide you on what, what you should put for book club questions. Because sometimes being the author and having to come up with questions can be a little bit difficult. Uh, not going to lie, that can be uh, can be a little bit challenging. So if you have, you know, if you have a group of people or people who have your best interest, Trace, like you're in the, you know, you're in the getting started for authors with us. So in one of your spotlights coming up, uh, maybe we, you know, maybe we talk about uh, what your book club questions might look like. You know, and that's the case for uh, other people that are in your group too. Rhonda, I love your marketing brain and percolating. Percolate away because there's so many, there's so many options. It's kind of, kind of crazy when you think about it. Uh, Midge, I think a personal journey diary with a starter questions could be a great addition and or pre-sale gift for my book. Yep, journals work really well. People love a good journal. There's a lot of logistics that go into finding the right journal that will be easy to package because, you know, uh, print on demand options have some limitations. So we have to, you know, think about the best way to do that. But yeah, so do we have other questions? Because I know I was just uh, going on uh, quite a bit about marketing. And as I said, I have, I could seriously talk for days without stopping. What other things are you thinking about? And does all of this make sense? That is ultimately my goal. I want to make sure that I'm sharing this information with you in a way that you can actually process and potentially, you know, do something with or execute. So much sense, says Midge. Uh, Trace, we have inspired each other with reflection discussion questions in our writing group. Yes, uh, we, we certain, uh, you certainly have. Um, so I will share that. So I've been sharing kind of throughout this workshop and we are on our last day is I'm glad that uh, Trace just said that. So she is part of our current cohort of Getting Started for Authors. Most of you probably can't see her comments because she's uh, logged in via YouTube and not in Facebook. But um, just the comment of we have inspired each other ref with reflection discussions and questions in our writing group. I, I feel like there's so much power in that statement because I have been sharing what the Getting Started for Authors program looks like since the beginning of be, since the beginning of this workshop, just kind of giving little bits of information to kind of see like, is this going to be the right fit for you or not? But you know, it's really kind of awesome to see how amazing the writing sessions are because just getting the feedback on what you're writing about can help prompt and inspire a whole host of other ideas. And in this case, uh, you know, Trace is saying reflection, uh, reflection and discussion questions. You know, it's just, it's the little things and having a group of people around you that are doing the same thing that you are doing that can all kind of elevate and lift everybody up at the same time. There's something very beautiful and magical about that. Let's see, I think I'm getting... I think I'm getting, what I'm getting is that I could have a landing page for the book club idea that would have a slightly different book club, book club questions, depending on the niche, home-based, entrepreneurs, parents, pre-wedding entrepreneurs. Yep. That's exactly what we're doing, Monica. That's exactly it. So yes, you could have different landing pages for different, every different possible uh, component. Yep. Uh, Trace is saying the Getting Started for Authors program is amazing accountability and inspirational support. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. Denise, we will have to watch this again to make sure I got everything. Yeah. You know, this is just a, uh, this is just me without even, this is just, uh, 
these are my notes to discuss with you written on an envelope because I'm uh, leaving for vacation. I packed my note, my actual notebook, and this was what was on my desk. So uh, this is when I'm not prepared. You know, this is just my, my bullet points to talk about marketing. So it's kind of crazy when I, when I have a very specific kind of goal, uh, what kind of comes out. So for a reminder, the, uh, these videos will be available in the Author Lab Facebook group until next Friday, and then they disappear. So if you want to rewatch this and take some notes, I would highly encourage you to do so. Brandy on my team will also be adding the transcript for this in the next, uh, hopefully at some point later today. So when she does that, you can also just download that transcript will be uh, possibly easier. So you can, um, you can print it out maybe and just highlight passages that you don't want to forget. So, um, or if you do enroll in the Getting Started for Authors program, the, all of these videos are still um, accessible. Uh, Patty's asking, does the group disappear as well? It does not, nope. And I do do, um, uh, what, what was I calling them? A lot like pop-up Q and A's. So typically I will do, you know, like just a random, like I'll, I'll and I'll give you a couple days notice, but I'll just go live uh, once a week, typically is what I try to do to just kind of come in and, you know, just chat and mingle and see what you're working on. And if you've got any, you know, uh, uh, simple questions that I can kind of address for you while we're, while I'm there, you know, sometimes there's folks that uh, uh, will attend all of them. And then there's other times that, you know, so sometimes I have like a good amount of people. Sometimes it's like three people who show up. That's fine. I'm just here to help. And so those are all available after the fact. So you can go in to Actually, I'm not sure. I think under videos, I think in the Facebook group itself under videos, there's a whole uh, whole plethora of things that you can grab uh, from previous Q and A's. So it's just whatever's on your mind. Um, so I'm not, I don't disappear entirely. Uh, but obviously, if you're part of a you know like a program like our Getting Started for Authors, where you're seeing me every week and we're brainstorming on your book every single week, you know that's certainly um, uh, certainly a very different story than me kind of coming up for like a half hour or so once a week. But I still do try to do that as much as I can, because I just want to make sure that you have access to, you know, getting getting things, uh, getting the information that you need. And I will do another workshop like this at some point in the future. I don't know when. Uh, I have not yet figured that out fully yet. So I did one in February and I did one in April and then just now in August. So there'll be another one. Um, and the content changes a little bit. Like I try to, I test different things each time to kind of see what's really working for people and, and modify it. So it's not the same thing each time. And if you do enroll in uh, the Getting Started for Authors, you do have access to the February and the April sessions, which were especially the April session. The April session was really different um, content wise. There's obviously overlap because there's a lot of fundamentals that are the same, but there was a lot of additional uh, additional teaching in, in April's in particular. So if that's something that would be interesting to you that you wanna have access to, you know, if you're part of the Getting Started, you'll just have lifetime access to that. So you might join and, you know, be overwhelmed to be like, all right, I don't have time to kind of read uh, all of these things, but, uh, or watch all of these things, but you have lifetime access so you can watch them whenever. And I do reference them pretty frequently as well, just because, you know, I have a lot of materials uh, the one thing that I'm thinking that I would like to add as a another bonus that it was not uh, it's not planned, but based on our marketing conversation is that I have a 30 day marketing challenge and that is basically a and a 30 day writing challenge. There's actually two of them, both of which I can include um, the 30 day marketing challenge is kind of exactly what it sounds like. So the goal when I did the marketing challenge was to help people double their book sales. So like if you sold five books, I want you to sell 10 in a 30 day period. If you sold a thousand, I want you to sell 2000. And it's 30 days of tips for how to market your book. And so some of them are, and it builds. So it starts off with things that are a little bit easier and it gradually moves through things that are much more complicated and much more complex. And you know, the end goal is that if you can start doing this stuff now, while you're still in the writing phase, as I've said kind of throughout this workshop, the more strategic you can be with what you're doing now, the more time and money and headaches you are going to save much further down the road. Um, so that is something that we have too. It's a 30 day marketing challenge. So um, I can absolutely throw that into the, the bonus mix as well because it just, you know, just further helps you.
a lot of times I will, uh, I'll think of something and I'll just share it. I'll say, oh, you know, I remember talking about whatever the tip is from, it was day eight of the challenge. And then I'll just share that kind of individually, but I can absolutely include that as just part of the, part of the bonuses for anyone who is interested. And I'm making myself a note to make sure that it is added to the group because that would stink. Do we have other questions or comments? I have a number of conversations already scheduled with some of you, which I'm super excited about. I am already working with a number of you as well. But for those of you who I don't have anything on the calendar with, if you would like to let's have a conversation about this, please let me know. Uh, I will, as you all know, I'm going on vacation. I leave in just a few minutes. Uh, so, you know, after that, uh, I will be back next week and it doesn't start until the 14th. So if you need some time to kind of think about it and figure out like, if, is this going to be the best use of your time and resources and things like that? Uh, you, you know, certainly I'm not going to, I'm not going to pressure you. So, you know, give yourself some time to think about it. It doesn't start until the 14th. If you decide, you know, you sit on it and you're like, okay, I really think that I need to do this. If you just go and enroll, um, you'll have access to all like the entire uh, content library immediately, uh, the Facebook group that we have, and then we'll be getting started soon. So I will, um, you know, add you to calendar invites and all of that fun stuff. So that way you have the, the information that you need. We have um, like an intake form, if you will, where it just kind of asks for a lot of your information. So that way we know how we can best serve you. And so uh, we, do, we do have a lot of, uh, a lot of focuses on, uh, I wanted that to scroll across the bottom while I was talking, but it's not letting me, let's see. Uh, there we go. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's everything I've been, I'm so grateful to have just the level of interaction that we've had this whole time, because it's really been like a number of you who've been diehards from the beginning. And I think that's really awesome. Uh, Pamela is saying you're a genius. I love the plethora of info. Thank you, Pamela. That is very, very kind of you. You know, marketing is just, I feel like it's in my blood. It's in my DNA. I have a master's in marketing. I had a marketing uh, company before I did this and before my consulting work, I was doing marketing for businesses. So it is just who I am and I cannot turn it off. Even when I want to, I will be driving down the highway and see a billboard that will frustrate the absolute hell out of me because somebody did not actually think through what they were putting on that billboard. That is one of my big pet peeves. Um, so yes, and typos and things that also drives me crazy. Uh, we're actually hiring right now for, um, for a temporary kind of project manager and then somebody to move into a sales role with me. And it is amazing how many people send resumes that are littered with typos or cover letters that are littered with typos. I just, oh, it's one of those things. We all have our pet peeves. I'm sure you all have yours too. Patty's saying, thank you for the information. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'll put up my uh, contact information on the screen if I can do that in an easy fashion, may not be able to. Yes. All right. Let me put that up there. So if you want to contact me, please, please, please do. Uh, Pamela, I'm so grateful for you. You will be seeing me again when I'm a bit further along with this book. Fantastic, Pamela. I love it. It has been honestly great just getting to know like little bits and pieces of what you're all working on. I think that's just, it is a beautiful thing. But if you go uh, number two on here, meet with Jen goes directly to uh, being able to schedule time. It does ask for some questions and things like that, but uh, or just asks for some uh, information. So that way I kind of have a good idea of, of what you're working on and whatnot. And then if you're like, listen, I'm in, I'm ready to roll, which uh, a couple of you have been, which is awesome. And I love, uh, you can just go right to getting started for authors. And that's where, you know, there's a, uh, it's broken out to two, two payment options. So if you want to pay in full, it's the $29.97. And if you want to do it in monthly payments, it's $5.97. And just remember, you know, it's a uh, two times a week that we're meeting for six months. So it is, it's a, it's a, it's a commitment, uh, which is why, uh, why we see results is because it's a commitment and, you know, we have a structure that really works. And so the goal is, you know, we can get your, can you just imagine like, just like snap your fingers for a minute and just imagine yourself in March and your book is already written. Like you're like, it's, it's actually written after you've been thinking about this for like decades or years, that is the goal here. So that that's, what's super exciting is to know that within six months, like you could really have what you need done. Monica, enjoy your vacation. Talk to you next week and good luck to everyone. Absolutely.
Yes, Monica, I will talk to you next week. Midge, I will talk to you. Um, looking forward to both of those things. Uh, Trace, I see you every Monday. Uh, yeah. I believe that is all I have. So you will be hearing from me. I'm going to be just popping in and asking just questions of you uh, just to kind of keep engaging, you know, like, let's keep having a conversation. You know, uh, you'll see me ask, you know, like, what was something that you like a big takeaway that you had from this? Um, you know, like just simple things like that. So just because this workshop is over, uh, I don't want you to just kind of like think I'm completely gone and disappeared because I'm not. Um, and if you do have a question while you're in this, like in the actively in the Facebook group, just tag me and I will see it and I will come in and I will answer it. Um, I do not, um, I don't ignore, uh, ignore things. So, you know, it might take me a little bit to see your notification that you tagged me, but I'm here, I'm, you know, I'm still here as a resource, just not in as an intense uh, 10 day in a row type of fashion. Uh, you thank you so much. You are very welcome. Rebecca says, thank you. Enjoy your vacation. Pamela, have a great vacation. Beautiful. Thank you all so much. This is wonderful. I'm going to uh, leave you be, but if you have any questions or thoughts or things like that, uh, please let me know. And there's probably a strong likelihood that I will go live at some point next week, uh, just in, you know, to continue to answer questions especially around the Getting Started program, because I know that there's been a lot of questions around that. So I will, I don't know when exactly, but uh, I will I will plan on being uh, back sometime next week. Uh, Patty, are your calls via Zoom? Yes, yes. I like to do everything on Zoom because uh, I like to see body language, especially when we're talking about writing a book. There's so much that our bodies express that we are not able to articulate. And so I like to use Zoom. However, if you have an aversion to Zoom or uh, for any reason like that, you could, you'd be absolutely welcome to join by audio only. You know, there's certainly, certainly nothing wrong, uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, we like to just kind of accommodate everybody because some people, you know, everybody, which is also part of marketing. Everybody's a little bit different. Everybody's interest is a little bit different. You know, I don't ever want to put you outside of your comfort zone in a way that's uh, really unhelpful or dangerous. So I, I know where those balances are. And sometimes, you know, even just being on video can be a struggle for people. Um, but yes, typically everything is on Zoom. Pamela, I'm so glad I found you on Facebook. I am so glad you found me too. And like I said, I'll do another one of these workshops at some point. I don't have it, uh, I don't have it figured out yet of when I will do it, but I will do another one and it will be slightly different than this one. So if you are here and you see me doing another one, whenever I do it and you want to, uh, want to attend again, please do. There'll be obviously overlap and similarities in, in many ways from a foundational standpoint, but I don't, have notes like you saw, like th these are my notes. This is how I roll for sessions. I don't have anything pre-planned. I don't have like, I don't have a, I don't have an agenda um, other than I know that this is what we're going to talk about, uh, which is great for you because it's not scripted. It's not rehearsed. It's not pre-recorded. It's just, you get what you get uh, and whatever comes out that particular day. So please, uh, please join another workshop if you, uh, if you enjoyed this one. All right. Thank you all so much. It has been a beautiful, beautiful uh, experience to be here with all of you. I am going to leave on vacation and I will be back next week chatting with many of you. Think about it, you know, schedule time with me. We'll talk next week and then I'll go live at some point next week too. All right. Have a great rest of your week and I will talk.